Okay, can you? Okay. So, can you... welcome to this week's um, Holotube seminar. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have Karl Landsteiner uh, here, and he will talk about his most recent work about is the chiral magnetic effect fast enough? So, we are looking forward to your talk, Karl. And thanks for agreeing to give this talk. Well, uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, okay, just uh, can you see my cursor? Does this work? Yeah, yeah, yes. Okay, great, good. And we all set. Okay, so <clears throat> yeah, the title of my talk is uh, the question is the chiromagnetic effect fast enough? Uh, that's based on the recent paper, which uh, I did in collaboration with Jewel Gosch, uh, Sebastian Greeninger, and, and Sergio Morales Tejera. Uh, and it's already accepted for publication and physical review. E. Okay, so here's the outline of my talk. I will um, review a little bit um, the physics of the chiral magnetic effect as it uh, is supposed to, to, to be realized in heavy ion collisions. Um, and then I will, I will discuss uh, a specific model which we, which we used to uh, investigate the out of equilibrium uh, behavior of the chiral magnetic effect in holography. That will come in two parts. So I will give a generic introduction to the model and then uh, discuss a little bit its properties, what you can do and, and what are our observables. And then I will uh, 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 twitch the model and the parameters of the model such that to, to match it a little bit to parameters uh, of the real world, the QCD. And then I will present some conclusions and outlook Okay, but before I start, I want to show you a movie. I hope this works. In 2005, physicists at the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider, RIC, announced the discovery of a perfect liquid of quarks and gluons. Since then, scientists have been taking a closer look at this hot soup. Another group of scientists has been investigating a separation of charges observed at RIC. Because the colliding ions are themselves moving charges, they induce a magnetic field. This magnetic field and vortices formed within the quark-gluon matter lead positively charged quarks to move preferentially in one direction and negative ones in the other due to the existence of different symmetry properties within these vortices. This asymmetry at RIC may help scientists understand a similar violation of symmetry in the early universe that resulted in the predominance of matter over antimatter in our world. Okay, so that's a, a video which was made some uh, time ago by uh, the people at Brookhaven National Lab. <clears throat> and uh, I, I've edited a little bit in order to cut out some part, which was uh, more about uh, the viscosity. And it's only the second part, which is about the chiral magnetic effect. Uh, it can be found on the YouTube channel, of course, at the Brookhaven National Laboratory. Uh, so let's, let's uh, recapitulate a little bit what uh, was shown in this video. So the idea is uh, that in this heavy ion collision, so you collide, uh, most of the time, I guess it's gold ions at RIC and it's lead ions at the LHC in Geneva. Um, you collide them, then they, they uh, in the collision area, they form a new state of matter, the core gluon plasma. And of course, one of the exciting things, which especially for people interested in holography, was uh, that this is a liquid. Uh, and it has a specific, uh, a, a very low value of the specific uh, viscosity, the famous eta over s, and, and that can be viewed as a sort of uh, success for, for holography. And uh, I think uh, raised the interest in applications of holography a lot. Uh, but then uh, the, an additional idea, <coughs> which was uh, proposed by uh, Kartsev, McLaren, and Moringa, is that in this early stages of the, of the collision, uh, you have very high excited uh, fields, uh, gluon fields, and these gluon fields uh, might, so this is supposed to be the vacuum structure of QCD, so famously the topological sectors, 
are classified by winding numbers. And if you're in vacuum, so there is a, a tunneling amplitude which changes the winding number, that's an instanton. But if you are not in vacuum and you have uh, a lot of energy concentrated in a small uh, volume, then it might be that you can over, go, over, go over this barrier just by, by uh, a sort of semi-classical process, not a classical process, classical field configuration, not just by an instanton. And, and so when this happens, uh, in these uh, collisions, then you would sort of uh, walk down a random walk on these uh, valleys here on this landscape of vacua, and you will eventually come out into this equilibrium stage where you can apply hydrodynamics with some value of uh, the chiral charge. Of course, these uh, instantons or these non-topological gluon configurations deactivate the axial anomaly, the gluonic part of the axial anomaly. And that will that means that it will uh, flip the chirality of some of the fermions in the plasma, and the state you will end up uh, with will be a chirally imbalanced plasma. So you will have more left-handed fermions than right-handed fermions. Um, okay, so this is a very very exciting uh, idea because it allows you to directly probably probe this non-trivial topology of the gluon uh, field configurations in QCD. Um, but how do, you, how do you actually measure that? What's an observable consequence? And the idea is that the chiral magnetic effect is the measurable consequence of this. So if you have a chirally imbalanced medium with more left-handed and right-handed fermions and you apply a magnetic field, then you will generate a current and the current will lead to a charge separation. So in this situation, the positive charges will accumulate here on top and the negative charges on the bottom of this fireball. And this leads to a charge separation signature in the final state of uh, the heavy ion collisions. Uh, of course, all of this is uh, de depends very much on non-equilibrium physics, right? There is, uh, this is very essentially uh, non-equilibrium physics. Okay, and where does the magnetic field come from? Well, these colliding ions, they are of course positively charged. They do not collide centrally. They, they, they have just a partial overlap and then they, they spectre this, which fly by, they create a current and this current will generate a very strong magnetic field. Actually, it's uh, estimated to be the strongest field, magnetic field in the universe. So uh, then in the second paper, Fukushima, Katsayev and Waringa, they analyze this further and they find this very intriguing formula, namely that the electric current is given by this axial chemical potential, which, uh, uh, is a, a proxy for the chirality imbalance uh, times the magnetic field. And famously, this coefficient C here is the same coefficient as appears in the electromagnetic part of the axial anomaly. So it's a direct effect of the axial anomaly. Okay, that's an intriguing formula, but um, there are some uh, subtleties. Uh, well, the formula has been, then, then it was found that there were a couple of papers which basically were forgotten at that time. Uh, especially the work by Vilenkin was completely forgotten at that time. And these formulas have appeared before in, in several other contexts. Um, but one of the important things here is that this is a chemical potential and the chemical potential is actually an equilibrium quantity. So it's not really well defined if you are far from equilibrium, right? So, so whereas this is supposed to happen, you know, in the early stages where you generate this chirality, um, it's not clear if there is already the concept of chemical potential. And, and then a second thing is that this magnetic field, of course, this, uh, this, um, these uh, ions which fly by, they generate a strong magnetic field, but for a very short time. So the question is also, what's the lifetime of this magnetic field? Um, okay, here I will give you, I want to give you some, some weak coupling intuition of what the current magnetic effect is and how it comes about is here I have the spectrum of chiral, a chiral fermion in a strong magnetic field such that the spectrum arranges in Landau levels. And there's the special lowest Landau level, which is chiral. So all the positive energy states, they just move to here to the right. Um, and of course the negative energies are the antiparticles there, the holes here. And this, so th this is supposed to be the Dirac C, right? We, the, all the states are occupied. And then this denotes the normal order of the vacuum and mu is the chemical potential or the Fermi surface. 
And then you can calculate the current by just counting how many electrons are there, uh, how many, how many in, the, in the lowest lambda level, and you, it's just counting with occupation number, which is just given by the Fermi Dirac distribution. So these are the particles, these are the antiparticles, they come with a minus sign because they are negatively charged. And, and then you find this is actually exactly two everyone gives you a very nice result, which just mu four pi times EB. And then you have to add to this, of course, the contribution from the fermions of the other chirality. But the higher lambda levels don't contribute because basically what you have to integrate over is, is an odd function of momenta and you integrate. Now here it's crucial that you integrate just from zero to infinity because it's chiral, but the higher lambda levels are not chiral. And so they don't contribute to this, uh, <coughs> sorry, to the, to the CME current. Okay, for some reason now, okay. Okay. Now that's that's the idea, and then the question is, how do you actually measure the chiral magnetic effect? Uh, what have people come up to? to uh, what what are the ideas? How you get a handle, a quantitative handle on that? So so what people can do in this heavy ion collisions, of course, you cannot see directly the core gluon plasma. You only see the final state, which are again the hadrons, uh, hadronized uh, particles like pions and whatever counts and lambda particles. And, and so you can just count uh, how many particles come out um, in dependence of the, of the angle with which they are uh, emitted. So the angle here is measured relative to this reaction plane, uh, which is given by impact parameter and the beam axis. And, and so you have the, 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 the parameterization for this uh, distribution of the particles in the final state is given like this. So V1 is just the directed flow. V2 is famously the, the elliptic flow, which tells you something about the uh, shear viscosity. And then if you do this for positively, positively and negatively charged particles separately, you would pick up, of course, the, the uh, uh, unequal distribution for positive and negative charges because there's a dipole moment, moment right? So you can separate this in plus and negative, plus and minus positive and negative charges. And, and that would be the signature of the, of the peridiot uh, chiral magnetic effect. Of course, A plus the positive charges should be just counterbalanced, just minus the A minus. The problem is that you cannot directly measure that. What you have to do is you have to, uh, you have to always average over many, many of these events. And uh, since basically chirality is generated by this random walk on the surface on this uh, landscape of vacua, you might end up, you know, in one collision, you might end up somewhere to the right with some positive winding member. And then in another collision, you end up to the left with a negative winding member and the negative net chirality. And on average, of course, there is no preferred, uh, preferred direction. So on average, you will get zero. So if you just average over all the events, you will not see this effect. It's just uh, averaged out to zero. And so already also some, some uh, a while ago, people came up uh, with uh, a better correlator, a better observable, which is the so-called gamma correlator. And what you do there is you do not measure these, uh, these coefficients A themselves, but you measure the two-point correlators between positive and negative charges and between say, positive and positive charges. So alpha beta is either plus or minus for the charge. And then you have to apply some, some uh, background subtraction methods because the problem with this correlator is that it's parity even, whereas your signal is parity odd, and that correlator is very easily contaminated by additional parity even effects, which do not come from the chiral magnetic effect, but they still would give a non-trivial signal. So basically, uh, effectively, what you do is to measure these angles for, say, different charges, a positively charged particle, a negatively charged particle, say, add up the angles, measure it relative to this reaction plane. And then the idea is, when you have two positive uh, charged particles, these two these angles add up uh, basically to pi or near pi, and then the cost would be negative. And if it's the correlation between a positive and a negative charged particle, then if it's chiral magnetic effect, the two angles would basically uh, cancel each other and you would get a positive sign for the cost. So that's the idea. And so when people did that, um, that's from, uh, I think, uh, from the star collaboration paper. Uh, that's the signal you see uh, in this gamma correlator. 
Uh, so this is actually LHC and the rest are rich data. And here, uh, this is centrality. So on the right hand side of this axis, zero, that means zero uh, uh, or perfect centrality. So there is no, you would not expect any kind of magnetic effect because the ions just collide head on. And indeed you see no signature here in this, in this uh, correlator. And then you further go out, you know, you, the, the, the more eccentric, the more decentral the collision is, of course you expect the more uh, magnetic field you will generate and the more you should see um, the signal of the CME. And indeed, this is what, what is seen. So you have this opposite charge correlator and the same charge correlator. And you would expect that the opposite uh, charge correlator, as I said, is positive and the negative, the same charge correlator is negative. And this is indeed what you see. So this, this, the signature here is that these curves are separated for this correlator, positive and negative uh, uh, sign correlation. And uh, another thing you can see is that for low, very low uh, collision energy, the signal is basically absent. So at 7.7, .7, you don't see anything anymore. Again, the signal is the separation between the blue and the red curve. Um, and here it's basically gone, right? Uh, so that can be interpreted as a signature that at these low energies, you do not generate core Coulomb plasma anymore. And you do not generate any more possibly this kind of magnetic effect. However, so, if, uh, so you could declare victory, but uh, unfortunately it's, it's not yet done because as I emphasized, uh, there is a lot of contamination from parity even uh, effects which have colorful names, which for me as a theorist, sometimes are difficult to understand what this means. So local charge conservation, transverse momentum conservation, cluster decay. So the people came up with all possible mechanisms which do not invoke chiral magnetic effect, and which also can explain a large part or possibly even all of this signal. And also there was a paper which analyzed PA collisions and they also found signatures like that. So that, that uh, makes the observation of chiral magnetic effect much more, much more difficult. So what people are doing right now uh, uh, is uh, this, so, there is, a, of course, a search going on for having better correlation functions, better correlators, which are not so much background dependent, all sorts of analysis improvement. And so it's really fascinating to see how, how experimentalists uh, come up with ideas of how to analyze the signal and, and filter out this chiral magnetic effect. Um, I understand very little of this, but I find it very fascinating because this is going on right now. And uh, one of the really, really exciting things to me is this isobar run, uh, which uh, has been performed at RIC, I think in 2018, it's finished now. And uh, there the idea was that uh, you keep basically the nuclear physics or the QCD physics uh, the same. It doesn't change, but you change the magnetic field. You apply more or less magnetic field. And the way you do it is you collide two uh, ions which are equally heavy, so they have the same uh, mass number, uh, but they have different, the, the number of protons and neutrons is different. So ruthenium has more protons and here zirconium has more neutrons. And so ruthenium has more charge and will produce a bigger magnetic field. Since the actual QCD physics doesn't really care if uh, we collide a neutron or a proton, it, it should be independent of this, you would think that the actual uh, QCD physics or the strong nuclear physics is the same for both, but the electromagnetic physics is different because there's more magnetic field in the ruthenium uh, collisions. And, and actually you can estimate it, you get sort of, well, of course the charge is 10% bigger, so you get 10% more electric field. And, and then in the signal actually, because it's a two point function, you would get a 20% higher CME signal. Whereas all the other background, uh, uh, signals uh, would be independent of the magnetic field, right? They are not driven by magnetic field, they are driven by the shape, by the expansion and these things. So they would stay the same. The only thing that changes would be the kind of magnetic effect. And, and so the analysis of this is still ongoing, but the exciting thing is that the results are expected to be out this year. 
So, but it's it's unfortunately still postponed. So, so if you're interested, I recommend here this recent paper by uh, Dima and by Xin Feng Liao. These two, of course, Dima came up with all these ideas of color magnetic effect and so on. Um, and and Xin Feng is doing a lot of uh, work to make this quantitative in simulations and have a very nice recent review. Um, so earlier this year, I heard a talk of Xin Feng where he said, you know, the results should be out early summer. Well, that didn't happen. And a little bit later, I heard a talk by Dima where he said the results should be out end of this year. So let's see. I, I very much hope that we will we will see something still this year from this isobar run. This would be very, very exciting. Okay, and also uh, this is a slightly different, the same authors, but they have a nature review on, on uh, also on current magnetic effect. But they, uh, one thing they did is they collected all available data and collected them in one plot. So there's a, a lot of rig data at different energies, and then you know there are error bars and so, uh, and then there are some LHC data. Uh, of course, this is a preliminary analysis. Backgrounds not fully understood. The correlator is all the problems I said, but the overall picture one would get from from there is that uh, even say if you subtract all the known backgrounds that people have come up so far at rig energies not the whole signal can, signal can be explained by background alone so there is some remnant it's not terribly big i think it's somewhere in the range of 10 percent or so which is a remnant which cannot be done away by background uh, known backgrounds. So you could say, okay, so there is a, there's an indication for the current magnetic effect really uh, taking place at RIC. However, the situation is quite different at LHC. If you analyze the data, then, I mean, this is, you know, this arrow bar here goes down almost to zero and this also, so the signal is much smaller. And, and, uh, it is actually compatible with uh, background only. So the same analysis would tell you, which would tell you at RIG, uh, you cannot explain the full signal just by background. Uh, at LHC, the analysis would tell you, well, basically all the signal is background. It's completely background dominated. Okay. Okay. So Another interesting paper is from this chiromagnetic effect task force. And they list, they give you a list of all the theoretical uncertainties, you know, the initial distribution of axial charge. Again, it's somehow random and we don't really know about its production and how it enters the equilibrium stage. Evolution of magnetic field, I will come back to this later. That's also quite uncertain because the question is how big are medium effects? How do they affect the, the magnetic field? Uh, Uncertain this later afterwards in the hadronic phase freeze out. So I'm, I don't want to go into this, but one particular point I want to address is the dynamics of the CME during the pre-equilibrium stage. So when, when the fireball is still out of equilibrium, what can we learn about the chiromagnetic effect? How effective is it? And can we, can we uh, say something which possibly might explain some of the things which are seen in the data? Okay. So that's the question I want to uh, analyze. How long does it take actually to build up the CME? Because as I said before, as I emphasized, the mu five here is, a, is an equilibrium quantity. It's chemical potential. And if you are very far from equilibrium, it's, it's uh, unclear uh, how much of this formula is really applicable. So what happens when you, when you start out in a situation where you do have a chiral imbalance already, but you're not in equilibrium and you start out with a situation where there's no current to start with and the current has to, to equilibrate itself, has to find its equilibrium value along the evolution. That's of course a complicated question. And, and well, this is not surprisingly, this is the holotube seminar. So the method to address this is holography. Uh, of course, you know, holography, as said already, was very successful in understanding or predicting, even if you want the shear viscosity to entropy ratio. It was also uh, 
pioneer Pachesla and Yaffe to say something about equilibration or isotropization. Uh, that was also sort of, you know, the, the, the analysis of the data showed that this uh, stuff equilibrates very, very fast, or at least isotropizes, or at least goes into a stage where it can be described by hydrodynamics in a very, very fast, very short times. Uh, and again, holography indicates that this is indeed uh, very short. And so, and, and for, for this equilibrium formulas here for all these anomalous transport like chiral vortex effect, chiral magnetic effect, there was a lot of uh, work in holography. And I think we have gained a lot of insight into this phenomenon in equilibrium, understood many, many things which are difficult to understand in, in field theory which is a bit surprising because, you know, anomalies are really independent of coupling constant. You, so you, sh you should be able to do equally well at weak coupling and at strong coupling. But it turns out that uh, the way these anomalies are encoded geometrically in ads cft gives you a lot of insight, which, are very diff which is very difficult to, to understand. In, in There are many subtleties which are easier to understand in holography. So I've, I've, I'm, I'm sorry if I forgot somebody, but there's a long list of papers which worked on this. Of course, we are also not here the first ones who, who ask about chiral magnetic effect uh, out of equilibrium in holography. There were a series of papers, probably there are many more. Casey, then I wrote a couple of papers with uh, Esperanza, with a student, with my previous student, with Sergio on the chiral voting effect. And uh, Martin has done work on that. And of course, Sebastian. So and I probably, uh, Casey, uh, and, and some earlier work by Ho Yi, Yi, uh, and possibly I, I missed some others, so I'm sorry if, if I missed somebody. Okay, now, this is probably a redundant uh, slide in this uh, uh, audience, so I will just skip it. We all know how holography is supposed to work. Um, and let me go directly into the model which we employ. So that's that's our action. And of course, what we want to monitor is like energy, energy currents, uh, pressure. And for this, we need the metric, right? The metric is dual to the energy momentum tensor. So of course, we need the uh, Einstein action, the negative cosmological constant in order to get the nothing to the under the city space. And then we want to monitor the, uh, the electric current, which is, uh, and uh, conserved current is, uh, is dual to a gauge field. So we have one gauge field in this antidesita space, but we also uh, need uh, an axial charge. And in order to implement the axial charge, we introduce a new gauge field, a second gauge field, which we interpret as uh, dual to the axial uh, current. And we need an anomaly because the whole thing is driven by the anomaly and in ADS CFT, that's just the John Simon's term, right? I've written here the full axial anomaly with both contributions. So the, the AVV contribution, the mixed anomaly between the axial and the vector current and the pure U1 cubed anomaly. But in reality, this will not play a role in my talk. We will only need this anomaly here. And, and then we want to do non-equilibrium physics. So we for this, we, we start out with an ansatz, which has a dependence on the radial holographic uh, coordinate, the U coordinate and the time coordinate V. And we write down a metric here in this infalling Eddington Finkelstein uh, coordinates. Um, v is of course the blackening factor then, uh, and then here we have the space uh, coordinates, right? And, um, there's an overall factor here. And what is important is this anisotropy factor, this uh, function psi. Because we have a magnetic field, we will eventually switch on a magnetic field, which points in the C direction. Uh, we will have an anisotropic metric. Uh, and this anisotropy is parameterized by this function psi. That will be another, that will eventually tell us something about the pressure anisotropy in the final state with the magnetic field. Okay, and for the gauge fields, of course, we implement the magnetic field as a boundary condition. Yeah, the magnetic field pointing in the, in the set direction. And then we want to monitor the current in the C direction. So we have a dynamical field, which we let evolve, which is the uh, gauge field in the C direction. And 
uh, the axial charge is uh, given by a temporal component, the V component in this V coordinate of the axial gauge field. So that's our ansatz. And here, oh, sorry, that was too fast. Um, that's the asymptotic expansion in an asymptotic ADS space. There are some integration constant like Q5, which will translate into the axial charge, of course. And, and V2, that translates into the uh, vector current, the electric current, uh, and then psi will give us uh, will give us information about the pressure, especially the pressure anisotropy. So, and F two is the blackening factor, which tells us about the energy density and also, of course, the isotropic part of the of the pressure. Um, so as a subtlety here in this expansion is that there is an arbitrary function lambda of v, which can be arbitrarily uh, chosen. And numerically, that's good for numerics because you can choose this function such that the horizon is a fixed uh, coordinate uh, value. So for example, at u equals one, which is a coordinate choice. Okay. Uh, what's also important here is because we have the magnetic field, we pick up these logarithmic terms in the operators. So, so we have to deal with that. And now we have to choose an initial state. Okay, so um, our initial state will be a static non-expanding infinite uh, plasma, but it's not in equilibrium. Um, we, will, uh, we will choose the chiral charge to be constant. So our idea is that uh, in, a, in a very pre-equilibrium stage, we have generated already the chiral charge. And now we want to, but we have not yet equilibrated. We are not yet in the, holo, in the, in the uh, hydrodynamic phase. And we want to see how long it takes uh, to build up this CME current, right? Our magnetic field, it's also a very simple, simple model here. The magnetic field is just constant in time and uniform. So it just points in the C direction and it's there always. Uh, energy density is always uniform, constant in time. Uh, and our initial condition for the evolution, which is the non-equilibrium uh, condition, is that the, the, the anisotropy, the dynamical anisotropy, which is, uh, which is given by this psi function in the metric, is zero at the beginning. So we start with an isotropic state. And the CME current is completely absent. Right? There's no CME current. So that's, this is why we are out of equilibrium. And then uh, in the final state, uh, because of the magnetic field, the pressure will show some anisotropy and the current magnetic effect has approached its equilibrium expression, right? So this is very similar. It's an, a generalization of the setup, which was, uh, I think, pioneered by Chesla and Jaffe and then the many, many works. With magnetic field, there is a paper by Friuni and Jaffe, but they don't introduce chiral charge and do not monitor the uh, the chiral magnetic current. Okay, so numerical methods, uh, I'm also not an expert. This is mostly Sebastian and Sergio who know all about this. So we use standard pseudo-spectral methods, um, subtract logs for better convergence. And as I said, we choose this function lambda such that the horizon is, a fixed, is at a fixed coordinate value. Uh, all of these methods, they are nicely reviewed in this paper, in this review by Chesla and Yaffe. Uh, the only original thing we did here, I, I, I didn't do any original on the numerics, that was uh, my collaborators, but um, we implemented the code in this new uh, language, Julia, which turned out to be very efficient. So uh, it's vastly faster than say the original mathematical code. And that was, that made it very easy then to run this in reasonable time. Of course, after, after many months of code development, as <laughs> to say. And um, yeah, so we also have to deal with the logs, right, uh, in the expansion. And again, here we follow the lead of Chesla and Fuini, Fuini and Chesla in their paper, and they, there they define. So you see, you have in this asymptotic expansion, this log term, which has to be multiplied by some uh, uh, scale which you choose, some renormalization scale. Now for the numerics, it's easiest to choose a renormalization scale uh, of mu, which is given by the inverse radius of ADS, one over L. Uh, that's, that's, that kills logs in the numerics and it's very, very convenient for doing numerics. Uh, 
However, it's not physical because this is not a real physical scale. And so eventually you have to rewrite this in a physical scale language. And that is done by, uh, by this formula, which is for the energy density and for the pressure, it's similar. So like this, you, you do your, your evolutions with some fixed value of this unphysical uh, uh, renormalization scale and then recalculate it into a physical scale where you choose as a scale, the square root of the magnetic field. So then you can, you can get, you, and then you can extract the physical meaning from value of the ratio of the energy density, for example, to magnetic field squared, right? Which is now a dimensionless number uh, and that's physically meaningful, so. Okay, so that uh, I have described and now let's go to the results. So we have done a couple of runs where we scan the parameter space like small magnetic field, uh, large magnetic field, small axial charge value, large axial charge value, and even what is easy in holography change the value of the uh, anomaly. So here, for example, it's uh, that's uh, a run for different magnetic field strengths, right? Here, the magnetic field strength is measured in terms of final state temperature, equilibrium temperature or different magnetic field strengths um, at uh, some value for the John Simons coupling, 1.5, which we chose just to have a number, and for some small axial charge, which is also kept fixed along the evolution. And here on the left-hand side, you see the evolution of the current, and on the right-hand side, you see the evolution of the pressure anisotropy. Of course, as you would expect, uh, the pressure anisotropy becomes larger uh, for larger magnetic field, right? And the current also here is uh, blue is small magnetic field. And then uh, these curves go successively to stronger magnetic field. And what happens is that the current shows this oscillating behavior. Uh, the stronger, uh, you, the more you crank up the magnetic field. So actually that means that real equilibration is very much delayed because you enter this regime of uh, oscillating, long time oscillating and so on. So it's actually not possible with the code to run this until this oscillation uh, go really down to zero. Uh, here for the pressure on anisotropy, it looks as if there are no oscillations are, are there, but if you zoom in, you see already the oscillations are also in the pressure. And if you crank up the axial charge, then you see clearly also the, the, uh, the oscillations in the pressure. And of course, more oscillations and more pronounced in the in the, uh, in the current. Another feature which you can see is that the current actually builds up faster for a stronger magnetic field, right? If you look here uh, to the current, the blue one is small magnetic field. And then it, if you take here the first uh, maximum here as a measure of how fast the current builds up, then it's sort of oscillating around the final equilibrium value. Uh, then you see that it, it builds up faster the strong and the magnetic field. Okay, so these are the features. You see almost unnamed oscillations, especially for large magnetic field and for large uh, chiral charge. That uh, uh, is an accord with uh, uh, a Q uh, quasi normal mode analysis uh, by Martin, Sebastian, and uh, two of my former students, and so, which showed that the large magnetic field there's the quasi normal modes approach the real axis. So you would actually expect this to see these oscillations, these long lived oscillations. So this means equilibrium is, of course, much delayed in this regime. Um, and I also said already that for large magnetic field, this build up time is faster. And if you think back about what I said in this weak coupling picture, where at large magnetic field, you're basically in the lowest lambda level and you're dominated by low by the two dimensional physics of the lowest lambda level, because there the fermions can only move along the, sorry, along the magnetic field lines. So it's effectively a one plus one dimensional physics problem. But in 2D physics, there is actually an, an, this operator relation between the axial current and the vector current. And so this is different to the chiral magnetic effect, which depends on a chemical potential and equilibration in two dimensions, it's really the axial charge which determines the vector current. And so if you're in this regime where two dimensional physics uh, is, is valid, the chiral magnetic effect becomes sort of an operator relation 
and you don't have to wait until uh, until uh, until uh, equilibration. Of course, we start out still from a non-equilibrium four-dimensional situation, and then so this current has to build up. But from this idea, you would expect that for larger magnetic field, it builds up faster, and this is indeed what we say. Let's see, okay. Then you can also ask here, uh, who is faster in the buildup? Is it pressure or chiral magnetic effect? And you see that um, as a function of magnetic field, first, it's actually the, the, the uh, this is the ratio for uh, buildup time for the current and buildup time for the pressure. So first, uh, the current uh, is slower, but then it becomes faster for larger magnetic field. And, and this is for different, uh, for different uh, charges, axial charges. Okay, and then there's some value here where they actually equilibrate more or less at the same time. Okay, another thing you can do is you can actually change the value of the um, uh, anomaly. So here we have plotted uh, for some relatively small magnetic field and a small charge, but changing the anomaly value. So what you see here is the pressure Actually, all these are different curves, but they all look completely the same. So the pressure is pretty insensitive to the anomaly value, at least for the small magnetic field values. But you see already these oscillations here, at least for the large uh, anomaly value. So the oscillations seem to be uh, more sensitive to the, to the anomaly. Okay, and of course, if you, uh, if you crank up the axial charge here, then you see this effect also in the pressure. It feeds into the pressure as well. And, and then in, uh, here's a function of the uh, anomaly coefficient. You also, we, you can also measure who is faster. But here you see they basically as, as a function of the anomaly, these equilibration times between current and, uh, uh, well, this is for different charges. So, but it doesn't depend very much on the charge, it, uh, but on the, on the, um, on the anomaly coefficient. Okay. Now, that was that was sort of, uh, you know, uh, just testing our model, what we can do with it, what sort of questions we can address. And, 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 and so this is already quite interesting, but we wanted to go a step further and uh, try to connect to the real world. Uh, well, and in, in, in this, you know, if you are a hardcore string theorist, you would you would say to going deeply into the swamp land because uh, I'm not worried anymore if this theory comes from some string theory compactification or anything. I just take the theory in a bottom up approach and adjust parameters to some physically, physical values, which I motivate from some physics input, right? And the two things, uh, two parameters in my model are the gravitational coupling and the Chern-Sanders coupling. And I want to match them to the QCT values, right? So for the, for the gravitational and coupling, we match it to the entropy, entropy density. So this is the expression for the black hole. And that's the expression for the uh, Stefan Boltzmann limit. So this is uh, the non-interacting limit of uh, QCT with bosonic and fermionic degrees of freedom. But of course, uh, at the temperatures, uh, where Rick and LHC are operating, you would not, we know now we don't see this Stefan Boltzmann value. We see roughly three quarters of that, uh, 0 0.8 or something, 80%, 75%. So we choose three quarters, which is uh, a famous number. Yeah, you know why. Uh, and we match the uh, black hole entropy to the Stefan, three quarters of the Stefan Boltzmann value to get some numerical value for it, for the uh, gravitational coupling. And for the anomaly, we match the anomaly to a three flavor QCD axial anomaly in order to get the alpha parameter. Now we have a model where we can actually uh, calculate everything we do uh, in physical uh, quantities. And let's see what, what is the outcome. So we run, we did several runs now, of course, these are sort of speak the coupling, uh, couplings in our model. And now the, uh, dynamical parameters, which are temperature, chemical potential, and the magnetic field we applied, right? So we opt for uh, simulations, which end up at the temperature of around 300 MeV, and we call this the Rick parameter space. And then for high temperature, uh, 
which we call uh, LHC, um, we take a very a high optimistic value probably of 1000 MeV. Okay, so that's the LHC parameter space, that's a rich parameter space. Uh, chemical potentials, again, these are the chemical potentials as measured in the final state or in our final uh, evolution, near equilibrium state. Uh, we started out with taking 10 MeV, which is a sort of a small value. This is one of the big unknowns because we actually have no idea how much chirality will be generated and how big this chiral chemical potential will be. But uh, so in order to, to, to get a handle on, on this, uh, uh, this fact that we don't know, we, we did runs with 10 MeV and with 100 MeV for both for RIC and LHC parameters. And then the magnetic field again, uh, the magnetic field is supposed to be very strong. So for example, in trick, it's around uh, in physical quantities, uh, m pi squared, where m pi is the pion mass, so 100 MeV. And uh, at LHC is much bigger, 15 times this value. And um, again, because sometimes it's said that the, the, the magnetic field decays very, very quickly, then we also did runs at much smaller magnetic fields, like 0 0.1, like one tenth of this. But uh, I will present, I think I'll present only the results for the 10. For the, for the values here outside of the brackets, because the others give qualitatively very similar, uh, no quantitatively similar results for, for actually for the things we want to calculate, the, the equilibration times. So here's the CME current. Um, and that's for the RIC parameter space for, and here's both, here's the large, small and large magnetic field, and again, small and large magnetic field. And you see that there isn't much difference in, uh, equilibration time, if we take here again, this first maximum, so to speak, as equilibration time, uh, there isn't much difference between the two magnetic field values, but um, there is, of course, at the LHC, because the magnetic field by itself is so much bigger, uh, the, it's much faster than at RIC. You see, RIC takes longer. Um, and then you can take the pressure on isotropy. And here there is an special uh, and uh, goodie you can do. What I talked before was this dynamical pressure on isotropy, which is encoded by this psi function. But it turns out there's some ambiguity. If you fix, uh, uh, if you fix epsilon over B squared by this value F, uh, and even you choose psi even to zero, there's still an ambiguity how much you uh, choose for this BL parameter, BL squared parameter. And even fixing epsilon b over b, you're left with the one parameter of initial conditions, which parameterize different initial state pressure on isotropies, really physical, not kinematic or dynamic as before, really physical pressure on isotropies. And so we can do uh, different runs here with different pressure on isotropies. And, but again, as we see here, it, you get basically all always sort of the same equilibration time, independently of this initial pressure on isotropy both for the LHC parameter uh, space and the RIC parameter space. Okay, so the first observation is that in this uh, parameter space where we are working, where we fix match values to QCD, we see no oscillation. So uh, the thing is, uh, we think from this, that this, you don't have to worry about these oscillations in the current magnetic effect at, QC, at, at RIC or LHC. You, you will not be in this regime. Uh, Yes, again, as equilibration time, uh, we take this, uh, you know, benchmark first written down by Chesma and Piaf and everybody follows, of course, which is like final, the, the value being 10% within the final value, okay, which is a good number as, as any other, uh, but that's established in the literature. So th this is what we're doing for different pressure on isotropies here for large magnetic field. And that's the equilibration time for the current and that's for the pressure uh, equilibration time. And you see for the current is basically independent um, for of pressure and isotropy and pressure on isotropy. Well, it, it's weakly dependent on the initial state, right? And the same is true here. Of course, it's much smaller. And here it's the same for small magnetic field. And as you see, the equilibration term for the current is basically the same. It uh, actually it is the same, right? For, so, uh, and if you compare this to previous studies, um, like I cited this before already, isotrop isotropization time uh, was estimated from this holographic methods to be 0 0.5 Fermi over C. And uh, people, um, phenomenologists like Ule Heinz, who does this uh, hydrodynamic simulations, they initiate typically 
in order to reproduce data, they have to initiate at times like with 0.3 fm over C, the hydrodynamic simulations. And so we find here, say for this parameter, 0.83, which is pretty, pretty close to, to what phenomenologically is suggested. So this is, and the difference between the previous simulations of this type is that we take the anomaly into account and the magnetic field into account. So, and that seems to bring it closer even to the, to the uh, say experimental value of equilibration time. Okay, and now uh, I said this already, but I haven't talked much about it. Now I have to spend a little bit of the last minutes uh, onto the lifetime of magnetic field. This is highly uncertain. Um, here is from an early paper which investigates uh, uh, lifetime of magnetic field by McLaren and Skokov. Um, here you see the decay of the magnetic field. The dashed line is in vacuum. And then here is medium effects where it's assumed that the medium is already equilibrated and has uh, some equilibrium conductivity. And you see the lifetime of the magnetic, it still falls down to like, you know, uh, one tenth or one hundredth of its uh, initial maximum. Uh, but it lingers on for a longer time. So that was another motivation for us to, to put in this, you know, 10 times smaller magnetic field simulations. And uh, you can find you know, many different estimates. It's very difficult to find, to find some reliable number. But so what we did is the latest paper we found where uh, lifetimes of magnetic field has been estimated is this paper here. Uh, and they give you this formula, which scales like one over square root s with the collision energy. And so you can apply this to Rick collision energy and to LHC collision energy. And that for Rick, that gives you uh, a lifetime of around 0 0.6 FM over C, which is good if you go back and see how long the current magnetic effect takes to be effective. It takes 0 0.3 or 0 0.4 FM over C. So in this situation, you can say, well, the CME is fully realized during the lifetime of the magnetic field in the weak heavy ion collisions. However, if you take the lifetime of the uh, magnetic field at the LHC, it's much smaller because the energy is so much higher, right? And even if the buildup time for the chiromagnetic effect under this idealized situation that the magnetic field is, is you know, has long lifetime, it's, it's shorter because of this higher uh, magnetic field which is generated. Um, it's not short enough to be significantly built up during the lifetime of the magnetic field in the LHC situation. And so this, this observation would explain why in the, in the experimental results I showed you before, you don't see much of a CME signal in the, in the LHC data. Okay, so let me come to an end and give you summary and outlook. I think holography is able to address important issues for phenomenology, for interpretation of data uh, in heavy ion collisions, especially for current magnetic effect in heavy ion collisions. We have given a very, very, very simple model. You can criticize this model in many, many ways. It's just the most stupid, most simple thing you can write down. But the numbers we extract from it uh, are very interesting, I think, and give very interesting results. Uh, it's compatible with the experimentally observed trends. So like suppress CME signal at the LHC. Of course, there are many improvements uh, poss possible in this model, right? You can implement a dynamical B-field, the B-field, which is short-lived. Uh, you can take thinking about putting it in an expanding background such that you have an expanding plasma. You can think about modeling the axial lifetime and so on. So there are many things you can, you can do. We have just done sort of the most primitive, most simple thing at this moment. Uh, now still, I, I think uh, despite this to me very interesting situation that we will have experiments, uh, date, experimental data this year uh, and holography I think is, is, is able to give interesting insights there. There is comparatively little activity in the community. So, Probably uh, also, I don't know what you think, but in Holotube, probably there is some, uh, some chance to probably come together one day and think also with people from the nuclear physics community, Dima or Xin Feng. Uh, one of the problems is of course, that many people in holography have moved towards this uh, condensed matter applications and not so much the nuclear physics application, but probably, you know, 
with input from the nuclear physics uh, physicists, uh, they can probably tell us what are interesting questions and what we could do. So probably that's worth to think about. That's that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for your very nice uh, talk and for these uh, interesting results. So are there questions from the side of the audience? Okay, if not, let me start. Um, so you assumed a time independent magnetic field, but also a homogeneous magnetic field. I, I know, of course, how difficult those simulations are, but how well justified is it that the magnetic uh, field is really homogeneous uh, in the spatial extent? So, uh, yeah, that's a good question. So I, I don't, I don't really know. Um, I'm not aware that people have talked about spatial uh, uh, modulation of the magnetic field. Even I mean, people have done a lot of work, and you can find lots of estimates about lifetime of magnetic field. But spatial extent, I'm a bit less aware of. So I, I don't know if it plays a role. So I mean, of course, you would expect that it's you know stronger at the center and then falls also off. But how fast it falls off, I actually don't know. That is. Uh, uh, okay. And another question is about concerning this um, oscillations, which are not present. Mm -hmm. um, so that is because your your estimate for alpha is pretty small, or um, right, right, yeah, yeah. So suppose this um, this rule for this seventy five or eighty percent of the entropy is, is yeah. wrong. Maybe your kappa would be larger than also your alpha would be larger. Yeah. Um, so that would quantitatively then change that result, or or qualitatively. No, it might be, but I don't know if you know, you also need strong magnetic field in order to see this oscillation. So I'm I'm not sure if you can um, if you can really uh, if you can really uh, say physically get physically motivated um, numbers for its couplings which would allow you, and for the magnetic field strengths, which would allow you to go into regime where these oscillations become relevant. Uh, my gut feeling, and from what we saw, uh, it's rather not the case. So I, I think, uh, I would think it's, it's quite a stable prediction that, that these oscillations do not play a role at trick. Okay, thank you. So I've seen that someone unmuted him or herself. Please go ahead and ask your question. Uh, sorry, can I ask a question? Do you hear me? Of course, yeah. you're very welcome. Uh, yes, thank you very much uh, from the lecture. Uh, I have uh, two and three uh, technical questions. Uh, you have uh, some time-dependent Einstein's equations uh, as equation of motion. Uh, the first question is that uh, does the nested algorithm mentioned by Chester, Chester and Yaffe uh, work here uh, for uh, your setup? Yeah, these nested equations, yes, that works basically, yeah. Very good. Uh, and uh, what about uh, adding uh, ghost bonnet terms to the action, gravity action uh, to consider a finite coupling uh, regime in the uh, boundary theory? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, uh i guess you could do that yeah yeah uh the, the, possible, the equation yeah. the yeah. equation of motions uh, uh, will be more complicated in this case uh, and uh, could be relevant question uh, to try that or no uh so for time evolution with higher derivative terms um uh, so how is this? You might always run into the problem that uh, if you have a high, high deriv uh, higher order time derivatives, right, you might run into some instabilities because of ghosts. So I don't know how this plays out in this uh, in these uh, simulations. I haven't seen that. I don't know if anybody of, of I'm, I'm not the big expert on the simulations. I don't know if somebody has tried to do this with higher derivative terms. Uh, I'm, I'm not. Uh, 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 we, do, 
I, I see the danger that you pick up some instabilities in this in this uh, if if you have ah, higher, yes. higher higher order uh, time derivatives, right? Yeah, uh, we we have done uh, uh, this uh, for uh, isotropization, uh, uh -huh. and uh, we uh, we saw that the isotropization time increased. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, is that possible to study uh, this for uh, this set or no? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. I think so. I mean, you could, you could, I think. Um, uh, so it would be especially interesting, probably, because the, the, the pressure will depend on the details of the theory, right? So isotropization, if you look to this, uh, that will very much depend on the details of the theory. Um, and the higher derivative terms you add, the coupling, the values of these couplings. But the chiral magnetic effect, at least in equilibrium, is ins insensitive to, to higher derivative terms. Oh, okay. In, 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 uh, it's just given by this formula. However, it's not clear to me how this plays out uh, in, in the non-equilibrium stage. So that would certainly be interesting to study how this, uh, if in the non-equilibrium it's still independent, sort of topological, or if uh, this uh, uh, build-up times for the current magnetic effect, uh, effect will also depend on this higher derivative currents, higher derivative couplings, possibly also in the gauge field, right? You could add uh, higher derivative terms for the gauge fields as well. Uh, thanks. As a last question, um, when you use the superspectral method, uh, your uh, equation of motions convert to a matrix uh, equations. And uh, what about using Python uh, to do the numerics? Uh, did you think about that? No, no. Um, we had, um, um, so I, I, to say the truth, I read some years ago um, about this new language, Julia. And there were benchmarks which said it's better than, faster than Python at that time. And then I did a first project with my previous student, Jorge, uh, and he, uh, in Julia, and it worked very well. And now it's uh, also this one. It seems to work very well. But uh, I would not, you know, I, I don't know if it's really much better than than Python. Uh, I can I, I can't say that. Thank you but, so much. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so, are there further questions? That seems to be not the case. Then let's stop recording and then we can also ask questions in private.